2016 Town Hall, presented by City Hall and Cable 14. I'm Mike Fortune and I will be your moderator for this evening. We are here live in the Council Chambers down at City Hall and before we start it is very important for all of you to know that we are following all recommended procedures including social distancing for tonight's broadcast. In order to promote social distancing the Town Hall is entirely virtual. Only essential personnel are here in Council Chambers. In-person attendance is not available for residents or media. Tonight we will hopefully be able to answer as many of the questions you have regarding the current status of the COVID-19 outbreak within our community. We have a panel assembled that will spend the next hour answering as many questions as they can. And of course all questions have come in from residents and we are still accepting questions. And there are two ways that you can submit those. Fill out our web form online at www.hamilton.ca slash COVID questions or send us a tweet and tag at City of Hamilton. Before we get started with the questions from the public, let me introduce to you our panel. Joining us tonight, Mayor Fred Eisenberger, Dr. Bart Harvey, Associate Medical Officer of Health, and Mr. Paul Johnson, Director, City of Hamilton's Emergency Operations Center. I'd also like to have a special thank you to the American Sign Language Interpreter and Deaf Interpreter. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, we start, before we start with the questions, would you like to begin with the current status of the city, sir? Thank you very much, Mike, and uh, thank you uh, to you and to uh, Paul Johnson and to Dr. Harvey for uh, participating in this town hall, of course, to Cable 14, and uh, everyone can dial in on YouTube as well for this virtual town hall on COVID-19 and these uh, challenging times. And I would say that uh, I really want to thank the community at large for responding in uh, very, very positive ways. Uh, not only uh, people in general, uh, businesses that have had to close down, they've done a terrific job of uh, listening to our public health uh, providers and, uh, and the lead from Dr. Richardson and Bart Harvey and uh, you know, taking the necessary steps to avoid uh, spread in our community. So a great job done by uh, the community at large so far and we, uh, we encourage the community to continue to do that great work based on the advice that we're getting from our uh, public health uh, officials. Uh, again, I will remind the uh, community that, uh, you know, I've been advised by the major grocers in the country that there is no shortage of groceries and toiletries in the country, uh, even though that there are some runs on the products on the shelves in the, in the community and some of the stores. Uh, those st the, the supply chain is there. Those, uh, those uh, shelves are going to be uh, replenished. And so if everyone would just buy what you need, uh, don't need to hoard or uh, buy more than you need for a couple of weeks as you normally would, then there'll be uh, much uh, available for everyone to get through this uh, challenging time. Uh, we are, in the, as the province has indicated, in a state of emergency, and uh, that will th then mean that there are many, many things that are being announced as we go. Uh, transit has, uh, has changed, as you're well aware, and I know that Paul Johnson will walk through all of that. I just want to say that, uh, you know, the uh, response that <clears throat> our staff <clears throat> Sorry, and the uh, public health and the entire uh, emergency operations team that includes some 25 uh, leaders in uh, all the departments in the city, including fire and paramedics, have done a fantastic job of uh, giving us direction and uh, providing the kind of uh, necessary steps that uh, hopefully will provide the kinds of uh, separation outcomes that will uh, lessen the impact of this, uh, this virus. So I just want to say thank you to them and thank you to the community and I really look forward to and hope that we can answer some of the questions that the community at large might have today. Well said, thank you very much Mr. Mayor. Our first question will be going to Dr. Harvey, if you can have your mic turned on there sir. Dr. Harvey, can you share an update about the current number of COVID-19 cases in Hamilton and the current situation as of tonight? Sure, thanks Mr. Fortune. Um, and I want to follow the mayor and uh, give a special biased shout out to the many public health staff in Hamilton that have been redeployed, are now working seven days a week, well into the evening. There was one night where we didn't get out of there until 1130. So um, to all the rest of the team, 
beyond Elizabeth and I, um, thank you and congratulations. The current update, and I can almost guarantee, as I've said to on numerous occasions, this is moving quickly enough that I will never have the up-to-date numbers. I'll have the numbers that I, that I last had, and that is that we have 19 confirmed cases in Hamilton. Um, and the current situation as of tonight is we are expecting, and certainly for the last number of days, we are having anywhere in the neighborhood of three to six new cases reported to us. We have um, certainly dozens of people that are being referred to the assessment centers for testing. Um, it's st still a small proportion of them that are testing positive, but we have growing numbers and that doesn't surprise us and we're um, kind of dealing with them accordingly. Just curious, are these cases where there are positive results, is it based on because they have met or been in contact with people who have been traveling abroad, sir? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Mike. Um, so we certainly have a mix of folks. Um, the test criteria are the symptoms of fever and or cough and shortness of breath, and then uh, travel to one of the effect, travel back from one of the affected areas uh, or contact with someone. Certainly the assessment centers are just that. They're not just testing centers. So we have trained, experienced clinicians that are taking a history from these folks, examining them, and they're using their clinical judgment. So in some instances, they will have a clinical um, hunch, if you will. Apologies to my clinician colleagues out there for using that. Um, and they may, and right from the beginning, it's, you know, if you have the sense that this person might be infected with COVID-19, test them. And some of those folks are coming back tested positive. We have a mix of folks at this point that I think are pretty reflective of what we're seeing Ontario-wide. Large proportion travel, uh, Europe, um, Asia, uh, growing number from the United States more recently. Uh, we have clusters of folks. Um, we have uh, cruise ships, uh, folks that have been on cruise ships that have gotten infected there and come back. And most recently, I think as Dr. Richardson uh, reported in the most recent media um, availability, I think with the mayor, uh, we have now found uh, at least two instances where our current investigations don't indicate any kind of obvious, which would suggest uh, that we have um, what we would describe as community trans transmission. So these people have been doing their regular things and in some way, some form, they've come in contact with the virus, and we haven't thus far been able to determine where that was. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Johnson, we will get to you now. Uh, you have been having a very busy six or seven days, and we appreciate all that you and your team have been doing. Mr. Johnson, what actions has the City of Hamilton taken to this point to help flatten the curve? We need to go back to last Thursday. And the first thing we did is we mobilized our emergency operations center. And I start there because in the case of this pandemic in particular, speed is of the essence. And emergency operations centers are set up to bring the right people together quickly to make the right decisions quickly so that we can get ahead of the game. And we train for this type of eventuality, although never, you're never fully prepared for this kind of thing. We train and we have lots of backups. And I wanna say this evening, the value of ensuring we have backups in every position uh, became very important for us in this current environment. Our city manager, Jeanette Smith, was on vacation when this started to kick off. She was on vacation in the United States. By the time she was able to travel back, she needed to heed and uh, show the leadership to heed the self-isolation uh, description from public health. So she is back in the city. She is self-isolating and is unable to participate as part of the emergency uh, planning. So uh, she's doing much from behind the scenes. Uh, she would love to be on the front lines with us. She'd love to be working alongside us, but she isn't. But that's exactly why we set the emergency operations center up the way it is. So we mobilized and right away we saw the value of that. We were able to react quickly to the evolving guidance and advice from public health. So what we saw was uh, uh, things changing on an almost daily basis and our ability to react. We immediately limited opportunities for social interaction uh, where that was by design. We closed recreation programs, we closed down libraries. So places where people would naturally congregate, we stopped those programs immediately, then took the step to close the facilities altogether. We have uh, most recently uh, decanted most of our staff out of our own offices. Just two days ago, we had an almost full staff complement in our offices, 
As of today, only 15% of our staff are actually physically located in offices doing work. And those are folks that actually need to be in the office for certain activities, and it's uh, really hard for them to do that at home. So the vast majority of our workforce is at home, working from home. And that's the kind of leadership uh, we expect, quite frankly, other businesses and organizations to take as well. That's the way that we reduce the interaction between people, and that's the way we flatten the curve. Mr. Johnson, thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue on. Uh, Dr. Harvey, can you explain the significance of the community spread and the city? Uh, they've been sharing that we are unlikely to be uh, infected with community spread. Is that still true? I know you kind of touched on it, but could you just go a little deeper, please? Sure, Mike. Um, I'm going to make the analogy with something that we're a lot more familiar with because we've had years and years of it, and that's influenza. Influenza comes back every year. By definition, influenza is community spread. Uh, we don't track down cases. We don't try to figure out who they came in contact with. We just know that the influenza virus will circulate in the community. It starts no earlier than the end of, of August and runs through till the springtime and will track uh, the numbers of positive test results so that we know where it is. Um, People generally, when they get ill with influenza, they don't know where they got it. Um, it might be a family member, um, so they know that a family member got it, they must have got it from them. They might be right, they might be wrong. Um, that would be community spread. So with COVID-19, we're early enough, um, as people would have heard me say last Thursday when the mayor and I were together for another media availability, um, that at this point we're in the early stages and we're still trying to use containment. So we're trying to identify every possible person who is infected as soon as possible. We're interviewing them, finding out who they've come in contact with, asking them to go into self-isolation to break the transmission of the virus, to kind of take them out of circulation, if you will, so that they, we decrease, if not eliminate, the risk they can pass it on. When we get to community spread, which again, as I alluded to, we, we, we think we have at least two out of the 19 cases that we haven't been able to figure out. They're, they don't look, well, they don't have a travel history, so they didn't import it from somewhere else because they weren't somewhere else. We can't find kind of people around them that they've interacted with that have that international travel. So somewhere in their kind of usual processes of moving around, they came in contact with the virus and they become symptomatic for it, enough symptomatic that they've been referred on for assessment and ultimately been tested. Um, you know. I would say in any given year, even even very um, very active, heavy years of influenza, the majority of people in the community won't get in won't get infected with influenza. So even in those years, it's going to be a minority of folks. Now for them, it's a hardship. For the healthcare system, it's a hardship because many of them will be quite ill. They might need to be admitted. They might need acute services, and we only have finite amounts of those. So I would still say that the minority of folks are going to get um, infected with this virus or know that they're infected with this virus. Because it's possible that people have been infected and it's, it's a minimal infection. They don't even know that, you know, it wasn't enough to prompt them to go and uh, seek health services. Thank you very much. We're going to continue on because I know uh, more and more testing is happening, especially Hamilton Health Sciences uh, starting tomorrow. So with that said, Dr. Harvey, how does someone get tested for COVID-19? Sure. Um, well, people have been tested now for um, several weeks. Seems like forever, but I know it's not that long. Um, we, we began to ramp up um, because in the, in the beginning, we were uh, concerned about you know, how this virus was spread, whether it could be spread over longer distances. So the amount of protection that people needed to be in to limit um, inadvertent uh, transmission of the virus. So in the beginning, it was the emergency departments in the city that were doing the testing. As we learned more about the viruses and as our colleagues in the, the two hospitals in the city geared up, then they were able to uh, move over to the urgent care centers. And at the beginning of this week, we've um, again, with partnership with the wonderful primary care community in the city and with the, um, the hospitals have now moved to uh, two dedicated assessment centers. And there are plans as we need them to expand the testing facilities, uh, facilities more. 
People would get tested. So first and foremost, and I can't highlight this enough, this is a test that's meant to diagnose sick people. This is not a screening test. Um, if, you know, the first question that any of the screeners would say are, you know, are you well or are you sick? And if, if the answer is that people are well, then, you know, the first response is then you don't need to be tested. That doesn't need, mean that you might not be, need to be tested in three days' time if you become symptomatic, um, but it's meant for being able to determine is COVID-19 the reason that this person is ill? So if somebody's not ill, I mean, even if they've traveled back from one of the hot spots in the world, we would still advise them to self-isolate at home, just on the off chance that they were infected. And if they become symptomatic, let us know, and we'll facilitate getting them into testing. So someone would get tested by having the appropriate symptoms. And then at this point, we're still using the international travel connection to somebody who is symptomatic, uh, somebody who is a case of co has COVID-19, um, and we would facilitate them into testing. Uh, this is actually a question coming from Nina, me now. In regards to that 14-day period, doctor, why is that so important? If I'm feeling fine by day seven, eight, I'm not noticing anything, why is it that full 14 days that people must abide by? Sure, great question, Mike. Um, so what we know about this virus is that it, it can take anywhere from two to 12 days to what we refer to as incubate. So it's incubating in the person. Um, so let's take the example of, um, so our city manager that Paul alluded to. In outside the country, comes back to the country, we're asking everybody, as Jeanette is doing, to self-isolate for 14 days. So the, the notion is when Jeanette was in Florida, Florida has cases, I think they just declared a state of emergency yesterday. Um, is it possible that Jeanette unknowingly got exposed to the virus there? So the virus is now in her body, um, but it's not making any symptoms. It's just finding its way and being able to find a way to multiply. What we know is that, it, that some people, so the, the, the incubation period is time from infection, from the virus getting into your body, until you start to feel sick. And so the 14 days gives us a little bit of an extra window. So we know that, hey, if you're not sick 14 days after you were in that place where you could have potentially get infected, then you weren't infected. Because if the virus got into your body at that point, then you would be symptomatic before day 14. So once you're totally out of any kind of risky exposure or area where you could have potentially been exposed, if you're 14 days past that, then you didn't get infected. Doctor, thank you very much. We're going to continue on. Uh, Mr. Johnson, the HSR is obviously a key service within our community. And uh, can you talk a little bit about what the city is doing to promote social distancing on HSR for both customers and, of course, the wonderful operators? Sure. Uh, transit is uh, really an essential service to keep the city moving and to keep people moving around the city. And so we've taken a number of steps in, in conjunction with the management at HSR uh, and the workforce. And I, I do want to say, because this is a good opportunity to, to promote that we're having strong dialogue with uh, our frontline staff, the union leadership and our management to really come up with creative solutions for programs that need to continue to operate. And there's a number of essential services. So in the HSR, we, uh, we previously announced that, uh, for instance, people with personal mobility devices are often assisted onto the buses by the drivers. That's often done through the rear doors. Uh, we actually said we need that to happen at the, at the front doors so that the drivers didn't have to keep walking through the bus each time uh, in order to get to, to that. To further help our drivers and, and passengers, uh, today we announced that uh, everyone will be boarding uh, who's mobile, doesn't have a personal mobility device, will be boarding through the rear doors. And that also means we're not collecting fares. And the reality is that this helps further protect our drivers from the constant pass-by traffic of people coming in. 
Uh, it does mean, obviously, we're not collecting revenue from our, our transit service at the moment. But you know what? The health and well-being of our drivers, the health and well-being of Hamiltonians, uh, trumps uh, the revenue so uh, that we would receive at this particular moment in time. The other thing we've done is put signs on the bus to encourage passengers to think about their personal spacing uh, because it's important we do that whenever we go out. Uh, the other thing that we have done to manage our workforce is we want to provide predictable and reliable HSR service. And so beginning Monday, uh, we will be moving to Saturday service, Monday to Saturday, Sunday service on Sunday. And that's really in an effort to ensure that we continue to provide this service in a reliable way. Uh, Mr. Johnson, just a quick follow-up in regards to other modes of transportation throughout the city, whether it be darts, Uber, Lyft, have conversations been had with those fine folks as well in regards to what type of parameters they should have based on the city, or are those going to be individually business-based decisions? So certainly there's always advice provided to, to private operators. Uh, I can tell you our DART service continues to operate. I'll also tell you that there aren't uh, as many, nearly as many calls for service as we see on a daily basis because the reality is many of the visits that people were taking on DARTs, those programs have ceased, day programs, things like that for, for older adults or persons with disabilities. So we're doing a lot of transportation of people though to their appointments. Uh, we need to keep the city uh, going. We need to help residents to do what they need to do. Uh, but because uh, a lot of residents are heeding the advice to only go out when you need to, we're seeing a great reduction not only in our conventional transit system, down about half the rides that we would normally see, but also uh, uh, far fewer tra uh, trips on, on darts. And in terms of using taxis and Ubers and things like that, uh, you know, again, make sure that you're uh, cleaning your hands, washing your hands afterwards, don't be touching your face as you get in and out of the vehicles, maybe crack the window a little bit, all ways that people can, uh, you know, protect themselves as they go and do the things they need to do on a daily basis. Some excellent reminders. Thank you very much. The questions continue to come in. The next one is uh, for Mayor Eisenberger. Uh, Mr. Mayor, what is the plan for city council meetings over the coming weeks, and can residents still delegate? So thank you, Mike. Uh, you know, as you can see, the, uh, the council chamber here is actually set up for a meeting, a council meeting and general issues committee meeting that we're having this coming Friday to deal with some uh, important issues, not the least of which is the budget. And, uh, you know, like any other municipality, without uh, resources, we, uh, we can't do much. So we uh, need to get those tax bills out. So hopefully uh, this coming uh, Friday we'll be able to pass the budget at uh, what I believe will be somewhere in the area of 2.9%, which I think is, uh, given the circumstances uh, and the challenging cuts that have been uh, taking place, probably pretty good. Uh, and uh, and we are, we're exercising uh, spatial separation as we are now, and we'll be doing the same at the uh, council meeting. Unfortunately, because uh, we, we have the building closed, we, uh, we are asking delegates to provide written uh, submissions to us as opposed to being a delegate uh, at, this, uh, at these meetings. So we welcome all of those uh, delegates to, uh, to you know, write in uh, with their concerns, their comments. Uh, they can, can all be read by all members of council. And uh, then we can make some... I would say functional decisions. We're not, uh, we don't have a loaded agenda. We've actually narrowed the agenda to, you know, specific issues that have to be uh, dealt with. One of them is delegated authority. Uh, my hope is that we uh, delegate our, our city staff to do some of the uh, functional things they have to do, not unlike what happens when we're at the uh, lame duck period in a council. Two months prior to the election day, council's pretty much lame duck and delegated authority is given to our senior staff to do under certain circumstances, uh, you know, uh, make the decisions that actually keep the city functional. And so we'll do that then as well. And I understand for future potential council meetings that the, and we've asked the province for this uh, authority to, uh, to allow for uh, dial-in uh, electronic, uh, you know, um, dial-in meetings for some, right now, some of the councillors uh, have to self-isolate as well. Uh, and maybe down the road, that may be even more significant. Some may be uh, ill or otherwise. And so, uh, you know, during this period, uh, province, will you allow us to, uh, to have a dial-in and vote, uh, you know, procedure through technology that currently uh, isn't allowed legislatively through the Municipal Act, nor is it allowed in our procedural bylaw. My sense of it is that the province is probably going to allow for that, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll enact that uh, on, on Friday, but not have it in place until such time as the technology and all the approvals are in place uh, down the road. So we intend to, uh, to keep council going as much as we need to, but only when we need to. And so delegated authority means that the staff can make you know, the primary decisions, 
unless something dramatic happens, I think council will concede that uh, you know the, the city will continue to function, EOC will continue to function, and if we need to come together as council, hopefully, uh, if if people are real, we can do that through technology. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Again, you are watching the COVID-19 Town Hall presented by City of Hamilton and Cable 14. Please continue to submit your questions by going to www.hamilton.ca slash COVID questions or send us a tweet and tag at City of Hamilton. The next question will be going to Dr. Harvey. Doctor, what kind of direction is the city providing to grocery stores, small businesses, and takeout restaurants around cleaning and sanitizing? Sure, thanks Mike. So I'm gonna channel influenza again. Um, COVID-19 is a respiratory virus. Uh, there's a whole family of respiratory viruses that we've known for years and years and years. This just happens to be the newest one. It has some uniqueness, but um, the advice would be the same advice that we would give through influenza seasons to try to decrease the risk of influenza being transmitted. So we know that viruses can be on surfaces, uh, the estimate so far for this virus is in the right kind of environment or circumstance, it could live on a surface for up to nine days. Um, and But we also know that diluted bleach, hydrogen peroxide, um, alcohol um, cleaning solutions can totally disinfect the virus. So um, keeping surfaces clean, using those solutions to keep surfaces clean will decrease the risk that you know, if, if the virus happens to get on a surface, um, then cleaning up. Depends on how frequent. I know that um, certainly at many of the counters when the city was still open and people were interacting, where you have a lot of people that are coming through, cleaning those surfaces on a regular basis. Maybe it's not after every client, but on a regular basis. Just recognizing that you've got a flow through banks and bank tellers, et cetera. So keeping those surfaces clean, the handles that people are touching, but quite frankly, all of that would be good things to do, you know, any time to decrease the risk that people could um, come in contact with a virus that happens to be left on the surface. And of course, people can in increase the protection for themselves, frequently washing their hands 20 seconds with hot water and soap. I think as Paul alluded to, keeping their hands away from their face, although I'm sure that I've touched my face two or three times. So, you know, these uh, natural reflexes are not easily uh, heard today that it's really, it's a comfort thing. Um, if you're sick, stay home. Like, sick with something else. You're just not feeling well, stay home. Wait until you're feeling better and you're feeling healthy. Even give yourself a 24-hour period if you see somebody that is sick in your workplace or that, stay away from them. Even kind of maybe send them a note or yell across the room and say, shouldn't you go home? Take care of yourself and clean surfaces. You mentioned door handles and money. Uh, one thing that popped into my mind as well is also point of sale terminals. Those are, we're constantly putting in our codes, checking in the savings. Stores and restaurants should also be aware of those if they're being used. Sure, anywhere that human hands are gonna be. I don't actually remember mentioning money, but from a guy named Fortune, I'm, money's a good thing, Mike. Always thinking of it. Absolutely, good <laughs> thing. Um, in fact, today, earlier today, I was over and, um, you know, I like paying in the old-fashioned way, and the person that was serving me said, wait a minute, I need to put my glove on. So put a glove on before I handed her over the, uh, the old-fashioned uh, old currency. Uh, does the disease also stay on, or the virus, I should say, also stay on clothing for up to nine days as well? You should be putting your laundry in regularly? So, again, I, so I think part of what the virus needs is it needs somewhat of a moist environment to be able to, I think once it's kind of totally dried out, so I, I'm not sure that clothing is really going to, with it being as porous as it is, um, certainly a nice veneered surface, um, a nice kitchen counter that's got a nice smooth, you know, watertight, not going to dry out very easily. Um, you know, certainly laundering clothes on a regular basis is, I don't think it's a bad thing in a civilized society. <laughs> of course not. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, Mr. Johnson, we'll head on back to you in regards to how the city, and this is a question coming in, how is the city supporting the homeless population during this crisis? So we're doing several things and, and really working in conjunction with uh, the service providers who deliver our emergency shelter services and, and drop-in programs and outreach services. 
A uh, couple things in the shelter system, uh, we're doing two things. One is how can we get rapid testing and really impressed today. We had a great conversation with members of the shelter health team and we believe we're gonna have access to rapid testing for individuals and shelters who may be exhibiting signs so that we can get those test results back and understand very quickly what to do next. These are individuals that can't self-isolate because they don't have a home to go to. So the second step is how do we isolate and then if the test does come back positive, uh, how are we also supporting individuals through that? So we'll be working through the, the details of that very quickly. We've extended some funding and uh, supported organizations that provide drop-in type services. These are really important for things like showers, uh, access to washroom facilities, places to wash up. Uh, you think about all the things that are closed, these are typically the kinds of places that people that may experience homeless would use, uh, restaurants and other places, and use their washrooms. So the fact that these programs are available for different populations will be really useful. Final thing that's happened today, and I, I want to mention it tonight uh, and announce that, is we have had a conversation today with our residential care facilities. Uh, all of them were concerned about uh, their ability to operate through this. Uh, we've confirmed that we'll work with them in the short term uh, to ensure that their revenues are there to provide the care they need to to their residents and residential care facilities. And we'll also extend some funding so that they can do the additional cleaning and make sure they have the right kinds of supplies on hand. Our message to those organizations that we work with uh, who are dealing with some of the most vulnerable populations are we will support you through this uh, because we know these are extraordinary sometimes costs and operations that people people need to go through. And the reality is that uh, I think with the, the healthcare providers that we work with, as well as the agencies themselves, uh, we'll come up with a plan of action that will allow our shelters to continue to operate for those who are not sick. And should we have somebody that becomes sick uh, who's also homeless, we'll have the right places for them to recover and have access to the health supports they may need. These populations are ones that if they do become positively uh, tested for COVID-19, may be at a higher risk. Uh, they all often have underlying health issues uh, and vulnerabilities that would make it important for us to also wrap around some health supports as they recover. Mr. Johnson, thank you very much. On to you, Mr. Mayor. A question has come in that there have been a lot of announcements from the federal and provincial governments over recent days. Can you speak to the city's involvement and in how you've been in contact with the upper levels of government most recently? Well, thank you, and uh, you know it's been uh, it's been an ongoing collaborative process, and I, I do want to compliment both the federal and provincial governments uh, for their nonpartisan approach. And you know what, uh, there is no room for politics in any of this. Uh, it is all about getting the job done, and they've all taken that approach, and uh, and they've been reaching out to us on a regular basis. Uh, I was part of a, a big city mayors, uh, twenty of the largest mayors uh, of the municipalities across the country uh, through FCM. We had a conversation with uh, Minister Freeland. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland uh, yesterday, uh, talking about uh, some of the things that they were going to be uh, some of the, some of the things that they were, they were going to be announcing today, and some of the concerns that we're hearing across the country and municipalities. And you know, a lot of what we're hearing is uh, you know the housing challenges, uh, the homelessness challenges, uh, businesses that are, are going to be impacted, and how are they going to be uh, compensated? All those things were part of the conversation with. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, and uh, unfortunately, I'm sure the, the Prime Minister would have been on those calls, but as you know, he's self-isolating himself. So uh, a lot of interaction happening there, and we uh, had a, a conference call with uh, Minister uh, uh, Christine Elliott, the Minister of Health, and uh, the Minister, uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister Clark, uh, in the same vein, talking about uh, you know the kind of supports that the province is, is, uh, is exercising, their thoughts and ideas about what uh, they might be doing uh, in coming days, and uh, getting some feedback from municipalities in terms of what do we need, uh, you know, how fast can we get it to you. Uh, and so uh, I think the dialogue and the interaction has been uh, fantastic. Uh, we're sharing all of the information that we're generating locally here with all of our MPs and MPPs, no matter what their stripe is. And, uh, and uh, so they're all in the know, and so we're also taking a broader community approach to make sure that we're all in the loop and all working on the, the same messaging and, and the same, uh, you know, important issues of uh, trying to get people to, uh, to stay at home, uh, to making sure they do the right things in terms of looking after their health and that they're not spreading a disease. And if it becomes even more dire, that uh, even more dramatic steps may have to, have to be taken. So, so far, it has been a, a brilliant exercise on, on all three levels of government. And 
And our council has been fantastic as well. And, you know, as you might expect, uh, everyone's itching to get uh, to, to be part of this, but it has to be public health driven. It has to be uh, through our emergency and operations center. Uh, and like uh, all of them have uh, conceded that uh, they're going to take a back seat and let the, uh, the important decisions be made through public health so that we're making the right decisions that to impact this issue as opposed to any other issues that might, we might deal with as a council. So I, I think it's been a spectacular effort. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, continue to move in that direction. This is not going to be over soon, in my opinion. And uh, we're, we're going to have to have a, a, you know, a longer term focus with all three levels of government uh, as we go forward. Longer term focus with always moving targets. Well, <laughs> you know, lines. and each and every day is a, is a journey. But, yeah. but the reality is that uh, each and every day, as things evolve, uh, the appropriate responses and, uh, and commitments are being made by all levels of government. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Dr. Harvey, back to you. And we've kind of touched on this, but a question has come in in regards to what would you say to people who have been traveling and should be self-isolating, but they are not? What is your message to them? Sure. Well, I think I'd go back to helping people understand why we're asking them to do that. Um, so the, the first primary mission here is to try to decrease the transmission of this virus. This virus is going from one infected individual to another inf individual who is not infected. And if we can, so part of the provincial uh, emergency declaration, the closing bars and restaurants, uh, getting people to social distance from one another, we know that this is, or we're fairly confident, I don't know if we're ever 100% in, uh, but this is acting like what's referred to as a, a droplet spread, i.e. it doesn't really, it doesn't float in the air, it doesn't get a long way. And that's why people are hearing, stay six feet away, stay two meters away. Because from what we know about this virus, if you're infected with the virus, so if I'm infected with the virus, Paul's far enough away from me that I can't, uh, my virus can't get to him, it's gonna land somewhere down here. So get people apart from one another. When people have come back from international travel, with international travel being such an important risk factor, um, having people that come back from international travel self-isolate, we're back to the 14 days that we talked about a little while ago, keep them away. Some, some of them, the majority aren't going to be infected, but for those minority, and they're not going to know right out of the gate. So we get everybody to self-isolate for 14 days so that the people do get symptomatic. We can identify them before they've ever had a chance to get in contact with anybody else and pass the virus on. Um, what would I say to people that aren't self-isolating? I, I think I'd try to help them understand why we're asking them to do that. Um, the risk that they're posing to other people um, if, in fact, they become symptomatic if they are infected and they can transmit it. 17 years ago in SARS, the, uh, the nice thing about SARS was, for the most part, people that had SARS did not pose a risk to anybody else until they became symptomatic. That made it easy. So you become symptomatic, we get you out of the way. Or what we did then was we quarantined people that were in contact and we waited and see if they were symptomatic but they didn't have the chance to transmit it. In fact, SARS was, was walled off and stopped by public health initiatives. This virus is a little more crafty than the SARS virus in that it appears that for upwards of the 24 hours before somebody becomes symptomatic, you can transmit it to somebody else. So you feel perfectly and well, you're moving around, you're doing what you regularly do. But oh, by the way, all those people that you interacted with for that 24 hours, you ran the risk of transmitting the virus to them and now you, they have a whole new group. So we're trying to break that chain of transmission. So I guess I would try to help those folks understand why we're asking them to self-isolate. Um, the 14 days, as we talked about earlier, Mike, if they're asymptomatic at the end of 14 days, then we know that they weren't infected when they were in that in, on that international travel. To those people who are self-isolating and do have symptoms, and the symptoms potentially start to get worse, what can they start to do to start to self-medicate, to look after themselves? What should they be doing? Great question, Mike. Um, so the first is anyone that's, uh, and I think the, uh, the brochures that people are receiving at the airports 
when they come in from international destinations or giving them instructions. One of the instructions is what symptoms to look for. So developing a fever, developing a cough, a worsening cough, developing shortness of breath, reach out to phoning Telehealth Ontario, call your local public health department, call your family physician, let them know, I was traveling internationally, I've been back for seven days, now I'm starting to feel sick, what should I do? They'll ask them about their, um, you know, what we talked about earlier as to what are the criteria for people being assessed. And for somebody like that, we will, we will arrange for what we call as a warm handover. In other words, we want it to be as controlled as possible so that we can arrange with one of the assessment centers, give the person instructions as to how to get there in as safe a way as possible. Again, minimize transmission. Get them into the assessment center, get them tested, get them back home to continue self-isolating. That helps us to determine uh, are they infected with COVID-19. Then our staff will reach out to them to ask them, by any chance, who in the previous 12, 24 hours of you becoming symptomatic might you have had contact with? Because we now want to self-isolate those individuals because, again, the mission is decrease ideally eliminate the transmission of the virus because it needs new hosts, new people that aren't infected, that's where it continues its, its life being. So we're trying to block off that from the, uh, the virus. Uh, we're gonna continue on. You're getting a lot of questions here, Dr. Harvey. In regards to kid-friendly activities, I know I've been spending a lot of time with my son and daughter taking lots of walks. Uh, what activities are safe during this time? Can they go to parks? Can they have play dates? Uh, can we take our kids for a haircut? Sure. Um, so again, I think the, uh, you know, it's the two meter distance. Uh, if somebody happens to be ill, if somebody happens to be infected and they're in that 24 hour period, or potentially, especially with kids, what we're learning about this virus is it appears that Children can be infected, but they may be only minimally symptomatic. So they won't have a lot of the big fever, big cough, be obviously ill. Um, so being able to maintain that distance. So even if they are infected, it decreases the risk that the virus is close enough to a susceptible other to be able to be transmitted over and infect somebody else. So sure, go to the park. Um, Again, trying to maintain that two meter distance to what, you know, to the greatest degree possible. Play dates become a bit of a challenge because, um, you know, the two meters and the kind of the social distancing becomes a little more challenging. Uh, you know, our advice is to whatever degree possible, maintaining social distancing. Uh, one of my colleagues that was interviewed a few weeks back around influenza. Um, was misquoted, but in retrospect, she thought it was a good quote. You know, in an ideal world, avoid people. And because if you're not going to come in contact with another person, you don't have the risk of transmitting that to them. Taking kids for a haircut or any kind of an interaction. So I, I don't know many barbers that can kind of do a two meter haircut. So I, I would suggest if it's possible, I mean, they might have to be camera friendly like you, Mike, and it might be a professional necessity. But if they can postpone these kinds of things, I think the, uh, the Royal College of Dentistry of Ontario has advised their uh, practitioners, you know, postpone, reschedule all of those elective and preventive visits because, you know, the proximity with hygienists and, and the dentists and patients and waiting rooms you know, let's try to put those things off to whatever degree we can so that we can, again, try to maximize social distancing. And really the goal there is we're not going to eliminate transmission of the virus. What we're trying to do is slow it down. We don't want to overwhelm the healthcare system. We'll hear the phrase, and I think uh, Paul or the mayor or maybe both of them have used the phrase, flattening the curve. Um, it's not only flattening the curve, it's elongating the curve. Um, at the end of the day, and we're not going to know till the end of the day, maybe one in every three people is ultimately going to be infected with this virus. Maybe it's two out of every three. I don't know. Um, the question is, do we want that to happen between now and the end of June, or do we want that to happen between now and the end of December, or do we want that to happen now and the end of next March? Um, 
kind of the longer we can spread it out, then we're not going to overwhelm the healthcare system. If it happens between now and the end of June, there's going to be too many people who are sick. Some proportion, it's a small proportion, but if a lot of people are sick, that small proportion is a lot of individual people. We have finite resources in our healthcare system. The hospitals can only handle so much. And if we start overwhelming that, which we can see when we look at other countries that are in that situation, I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge that we would like to avoid. Dr. Harvey, we're going to give you a, a quick little break here, let you, let you get some water in you. We're going to jump over to Paul Johnson now. Paul, recognizing that city facilities are closed to the public, uh, what kind of city services will still be available for the residents? What can we expect? Short answer is lots. And let's start with a really important one. Essential services have not been affected by this. We continue to deliver the key services uh, that are around health and safety in this community. Our water system remains as intact as it uh, was before all of this, and you can drink the great Hamilton water to your heart's content. Our emergency services, police, fire, and, and uh, paramedics are there at your call. And so when people have emergencies, we'll be there. We've talked about transit. It's a service that we're going to continue to operate. So things like that have been unaffected, and we've been ensuring that we have the right staffing to continue those services. Great thing about the city of Hamilton is over the last number of years, we put a lot of our services online. You can do lots with the city of Hamilton through your computer. You could before coronavirus. Maybe this will be a way that people really do explore the online opportunities or the on-phone opportunities uh, for our services. So. Uh, all of those are listed on our website, hamilton.ca. You can take a look at all the things you can do. You can pay your taxes, always important to keep the city going. You can renew licenses. You can even, you can even submit plans and, and uh, things to do with construction. What we're doing now, Mike, is we're looking at how we can deliver what we'll call important services in different ways. So we need to figure out how to safely, for instance, do inspections at building sites so that we can keep construction going. We cannot have any, strong, any more of an economic impact than there already has been. You heard the Premier talk about it. We need to keep construction going in this, in this province, and there are ways to do that, and we want to support that. You can't do much construction if we can't get our building inspectors on site. So we'll have to figure those pieces out. So we're learning a lot about how to deliver services in remote locations, how to deliver services in different ways. And I think that over the coming weeks, you're going to see us uh, have more and more of those services uh, you know, come back online. We won't be opening things like recreation facilities, the public library system, encouraging events of large gatherings uh, before we are absolutely 100% sure that that doesn't pose a risk to the community. So those things are going to be offline for a while. But a lot of things are coming online. I do know that there's been some specific questions about why were the waste transfer stations and their community recycling centers closed uh, the other day. I can tell you we did that out of an abundance of, ca of caution. There is an interaction that happens, albeit uh, fairly low. It's me unloading my garbage into a bin. Uh, we expect that program to be open within the next couple of days. And people, I guess when you're at home with all that social isolation, people are finally getting to their garages and to their basements and deciding it's time to do a bit of early spring cleaning. So we want to support that. The other thing I can tell you is we have seen a slight uptick in illegal dumping in the last couple of days. So we want to encourage folks to take it to the right place. So we'll get that service up and going in the next couple of days. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, Mr. Mayor, what measures will be taken to ease the financial burden that COVID-19 will have on small businesses? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike. That's a good question. Now, let me just finish with, uh, you know, the, uh, the, I think it was yesterday they announced the, uh, the transfer station closings, and uh, I couldn't get out of my driveway before I was informed by one of my neighbors that he couldn't get rid of his garbage. So that, uh, that was an instantaneous reaction that uh, obviously filtered through, and, you know, I th hopefully we can get that service back up and running for the people that are doing exactly what uh, Paul was talking about, which is they're, they're doing their spring cleaning. They're going home and rifling through the things that they meant to get rid of and haven't done. So uh, a lot of that is happening. But on the, on the business side, so uh, uh, we are partnering with uh, the three chambers of commerce and uh, we have as part of the uh, Emergency Operations Center our economic development director uh, and we're taking a kind of a holistic approach to this in partnership with the chamber to have a look at not only business continuity, 
uh, as much as we can uh, right now, as well as, you know, what does the, uh, the, the economic recovery look at like, uh, you know, a little later on. And so tomorrow, uh, the, the, uh, the Chamber and uh, the City will, uh, will have a website up and running and we'll be announcing uh, some initiatives that, uh, that can be taken locally here to help support the local economy. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, you know, very dramatic announcement from the federal government this morning, some $82 billion, uh, which I, I think is probably a beginning of a, of a you know, a financial commitment to, uh, to help, uh, you know, for temporary wage subsidies. So, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, a maximum of subsidy of 1375 per employee or 25000 per employer for businesses and uh, to offset some of the wage issues that... Uh, they're dealing with. Uh, businesses will be able to benefit immediately from that support and reduce their remittance of income tax withheld on their employee remuneration. So that's a, that's a benefit. Income tax deferral. So uh, that can uh, now be deferred until August the 31st. Uh, a lot of federal, you know, positive initiatives. And uh, small credit to small and medium-sized businesses and additional $10 billion of uh, credit support for small to medium-sized businesses. And I you know, know from first-hand experience that uh, many small businesses have, uh, are, are, are closing or are need to close, can't sustain themselves at this point. Uh, my sister-in-law, I won't give her the, the name of the, the location, but has a lovely chocolate shop and a couple of locations, unfortunately had to announce today to, uh, that she was going to close and uh, very supportive staff. Hopefully, uh, you know, some of these uh, provincial and federal initiatives will help uh, them stay in business a little longer, support their employees a little longer, uh, and then look at some, uh, you know, future recovery as, as we work through these issues. You know, these are drastically difficult times for small business owners, for their employees, uh, for all of us, quite frankly, but uh, even more so for someone that has to make a decision as to whether I keep my doors open or do I, I, I close my doors. Uh, you know, the mandated ones have been the restaurants that are required to close. Uh, what I'm doing is uh, each and every day, uh, you know, I'm uh, ordering, ordering uh, in or ordering out doing takeout from uh, some of our local restaurants to help support the, them as they kind of work through these issues. Uh, so far, it's been uh, the French and, uh, and buddies on the mountain, and we'll, uh, we'll spread that out around town. Our residents can do the same. If you're, uh, you know, accustomed to going out for lunch, uh, maybe you could uh, call ahead and, uh, and do a takeout order. That will help support them. You can, get, you can buy gift certificates. I think some of those are the, the localized ideas that can happen. For, uh, for local businesses and uh, future employee, employees. So I would say most of the, uh, the financial benefits are gonna come from our federal and provincial partners. Uh, $82 billion sounds staggering, but uh, I would think that there's probably more on the way. And uh, hopefully that will uh, stem the tide of some of the economic challenges that we're gonna face uh, here in all of our communities uh, right across the country. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dr. Harvey, back to you. Earlier, you had mentioned that this virus can, can stay around for up to nine days on surfaces. The question that we have coming in now, is it safe to share books and puzzles with friends or neighbours while in self-isolation? Um, and, and would the virus live on these types of objects? Sure. Um, well, again, as we talked about earlier, Mike, it depends on what the surface of the puzzle or the book is. Many of them are laminated, so they would be that kind of water proof. Um, I think my advice would be to give them a wipe down as well, um, either when you're receiving the book or when you're handing the book off. Uh, I was in a restaurant recently and took note that when they, this was before they were closed and when you could still sit, but even at that point, um, at the, uh, the entrance desk, figure out how many people they were and they had kind of a wipe there. So each of the menus, they were wiping them down before they took them over to the table for us, I think the same thing uh, would serve. The whole notion of kind of, um, you know, with friends or neighbors, we get back to the point of being able to try to, you know, games of euchre or bridge, you're usually within two meters of one another. So, you know, there's modifications as to what you can do, but certainly human beings for the most part are social beings. So being able to find ways to interact with one another in the same space, but trying to give social space or using other modalities, FaceTime, Zoom, Skype, to, uh, to be able to have, you know, be able to see the facial expressions and that. But acknowledging that the virus can survive up to nine days on a surface, so giving it a wipe down with that uh, diluted bleach or an alcohol wipe, a Clorox wipe, whatever, 
um, is, is a great thing to do. Thank you very much. And it has been fun on social media watching how people are being creative with um, pub crawls and so on and so forth. <laughs> Anyways, uh, Paul, we're going to come back to you now. We talked about closures, and I know this is a bit of a moving target, but the question has come in, so I will ask it. In regards to closures and impacts, do you foresee it to go beyond April 5th, 2020? So the short answer is we don't know. Uh, and, and that's the short answer, but let me elaborate just a bit. We did choose a time frame. Uh, one is that allowed us to just mobilize and work towards something. It did match up with what the province was doing around their schools as well. And so it's been, I think, what we call the first milestone. Uh, let's see what happens in, at that time, about three weeks uh, a time when we announce that. Uh, I think as, as I look at this situation, uh, and no one has a crystal ball, it becomes harder and harder for me to believe that in now uh, just over two weeks, we're going to be clear of this situation. And I don't say that because I have any crystal ball, but I listen to even uh, you know the health folks who say, yeah, we might be in some situation that's better in two or three weeks, it might be four to six weeks. I've heard eight weeks, I've heard uh, you know longer. So I, I think we are making our plans now, and this is all part of the Emergency Operations Center planning process. First of all, you deal with what's right in front of you and you set some targets and that way you can spend less time arguing about uh, time frames and more time just getting on with the business at hand. So we did choose a fairly short time frame. Our work right now is to actually plan. So if we get closer and closer to that April 5th date and we realize that we can't uh, reopen some of these programs as quickly, that we're gonna find alternative ways to deliver some services and the reality is others may remain uh, close to the public, uh, but we're going to do our work over the next couple of weeks to see where, where we're at. But I really don't see, and, and believe me, we scour on a daily basis for someone who can say, here is even, even a vague timeline. Uh, I'll take vague at this point, uh, forget to precise. And I think what we're doing right now is we're managing through this. And it's a, it's a, it's a cliche that, that I know people just kind of shrug off, but a new normal is, that we're spending less time interacting with people, even the people that are close to us. The new normal is we're finding different ways to deliver services that are non-essential so that we can keep going because this isn't going to be over in a day or two or perhaps even a week or two. And those are things that we haven't dealt with before in this community and we're all gonna have to rally together. And as the mayor says, and if you say, as you've said, be creative about the ways that we can support business when we can't go there be creative with the way we can have fun and interact when we can't go to some of the places that we love to go and have fun and interact with. Uh, that's going to be the way things are, I think, for a little bit of a period of time. And the more we get our head around that, the more we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do to get ourselves back into that recovery mode. Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor, final question is going to go to you. You have about two minutes. Hoarding and price gouging are severely reducing in-store availability and affordability of essential materials. What can the city do to facilitate orderly, socially responsible distribution of these materials? Yeah, I mean, we've talked about that often, Mike. And, uh, you know, as I said at the outset, uh, you know, hoarding isn't necessary. There is no supply chain issue for uh, groceries and, uh, and toiletries. Toilet paper comes up a lot. Um, there is no need for people to, uh, you know, take six months supply worth of, uh, of those goods. Uh, you know, the, the supplies are going to continue to come in. The uh, supply chain is functioning as we uh, are, are aware from our, all of our grocery chains. So just take what you need. Uh, don't don't uh, take more than you need. And, uh, you know, next time you need to go to the grocery store, if you've left some behind, then there'll be something there for you as well. So I'm hoping that, uh, that people will take that, uh, that approach. Uh, let me just reinforce what Paul said in Amerigo. I mean, we can all think about timelines. Nobody really knows how this is going to play out. Uh, the important thing that happens right now is that everyone has to assume and act like they're a carrier. If you don't, then you potentially could unwittingly, as the doctor says, you could potentially unwittingly contaminate someone else, and that's where community spread starts to take off. So if we all assume that we're potentially a carrier and act accordingly, so maintain that spatial separation, wash our hands, cough into our elbows, stay home as much as possible, then we have an opportunity to, uh, to try and curtail this uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, in the absence of that, it really lies in the hands of the community. We can make all the recommendations in the world uh, if the community at large doesn't participate, and so far they have. Uh, if they don't continue, then uh, we are going to have continuing problems. But uh, so the encouragement is 
presume you are presume you are a carrier and act accordingly. If you're ill, stay home for sure. Uh, if you've been away, stay home. And if you're uh, if you're uh, uh, you know going to be uh, out and about and maintain that spatial separation, I'm asking everybody to uh, to work hard, be kind to one another, uh, 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 be reasonable in terms of what you do in terms of uh, shopping, and uh, be generous to those that are uh, having challenges in our community more than uh, everyone else. To Mayor Fred Eisenberger, Paul Johnson, and Dr. Bart Harvey, thank you very much. Also to our uh, American Sign Language interpreter and deaf interpreter, thank you very much. Uh, if you are looking for more information, uh, we have a hotline. You can obviously visit www.hamilton.ca slash coronavirus. You can call 905-974-9848 or you can email phscovid19 at hamilton.ca. We'd like to thank everyone for your questions and for watching tonight. Please continue to monitor Cable 14 and other local media outlets for the latest news and updates from the City of Hamilton regarding the COVID-19 outbreak. Again, thank you to our panel. And as I always like to say, Hamilton, look after yourself, look after each other, and be safe. Thank you and good night.